Wait, how does this work? You just press the button. This one? No, not that one. <laughs> You're listening to Press the Button, a Plowshares Fund podcast dedicated to nuclear policy and national security. Everything seems impossible to what happens. Everyone would be affected by a nuclear war. Our government is planning to spend trillions of dollars to develop new nuclear weapons that we don't need. You can't win a nuclear war. We are all experts on nuclear weapons because we are all going to be affected by those nuclear weapons. And here's your host, Michelle Dover. Welcome back to Press the Button. This is our 22nd episode. I'm Michelle, Director of Programs, one of your hosts, and my co-host, Plowshares President Joe Strincioni, is currently traveling, but you will hear from him later on in the episode. He will be interviewing Hans Christensen, who's the Director of the Nuclear Information Project at Federation of American Scientists. Hans is the author of The Nuclear Notebook, um, which is the go-to resource on all things global nuclear stockpiles. You'll hear him talk with Joe about Chinese and Russian modernization plans and the state of arsenals around the world. On early warning, our new segment will be discussing Iran's latest announcement about its nuclear program, Russia's plan to produce cruise missiles, and Congress's return to Washington. Then you'll hear Joe answer a question from one of our listeners. We do this Q&A every week, so please send your questions to press the button, all one word, press the button at plowshares.org, and we'll do our best to give you an answer on the show. As always, if you like what you hear, please rate, review, and subscribe. Since we're a podcast, this is how we know whether or not you like what you're hearing. And now, the news. And now, early warning. Early warning. Early warning. Early warning. A seven-minute synopsis of this week's nuclear news. Welcome back to Early Warning. Today I am joined by Leon Ratz, Senior Program Officer in the Materials Risk Management Program at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, and Mary Kaczynski, Plowshare's very own Deputy Director of Policy. Thank you both for joining me. Pleasure to be here. Um, So as you know, Early Warning is our seven-minute news segment. Um, This seven minutes is about the time the U.S. President would have to respond if he or she got word of an incoming nuclear strike. The clock is ticking. It was a busy week. So let's go. Mary, an official from Iran's Atomic Energy Organization said on Saturday that Iran now uses advanced centrifuges that can enrich uranium beyond the current levels. More efficiently, hence the advanced. Um, Iran has already increased its enrichment level as well as increased its stockpile of enriched uranium. And all of this is in response to the failure of the Europeans to offer Iran enough sanctions relief following the U.S. leaving the deal. How does this new announcement affect Iran's timeline to have enough nuclear material for a nuclear weapon, if it so chose? It probably will have an impact on Iran's breakout timeline, but it's really unclear right now because Iran hasn't specified what exact centrifuges they might begin using. It's also very clear, though, that Iran is not sprinting toward a nuclear weapon, and that's the really important thing to keep in mind. This is the third step Iran's taken to reduce its compliance with the JCPOA in response to the U.S. abrogation of the deal. It's a minor step and it's totally reversible. So if the Europeans do come through and provide some economic benefits to Iran, Iran could relatively easily come back into full compliance with the nuclear deal. And they're still complying with the vast majority of its commitments under the nuclear agreement. It is, although, you know, it's, you know, we've talked about before these every 60 days and watching, you know, yet another step what can we do? What can the United States do to slow this down? And what do you think are the chances of being able to bring Iran back in? Sure. So when President Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal, it was entirely without cause. So Trump committed to pulling out of the agreement. He's called it a terrible deal. He and John Bolton and others insisted that Iran was cheating 
Iran was not. They were complying with the nuclear agreement until very recently. They were in full compliance, and that was verified by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So the U.S. can uh, assist this process by coming back into compliance and waiving those nuclear sanctions, assuming Iran also comes back into compliance, which, again, it could do by simply reversing these steps. Now, the French have been working very hard with the Iranians to put together an economic incentives package for Iran to induce Iran to come back into compliance with the nuclear deal and to take some additional steps including uh, working on Gulf security, security in the region, and talking about or negotiating, for example, um, other problematic areas like regional security. If Trump agrees to the French-Iranian package, that would be that would be an enormous diplomatic breakthrough. It remains to be seen if President Trump's going to be willing to do that because, it, again, it would involve lifting some of these sanctions that he imposed on Iran. Thank you, Mary. Leon, Russian President Vladimir Putin said Thursday that Russia will start producing medium-range missiles that were previously banned under the INF Treaty, the treaty that the U.S. just ditched last month. However, he said that Russia won't deploy those missiles unless the United States does. So what is the likelihood that we actually see these missiles deployed? Well, I certainly hope we don't see these missiles deployed. The United States does not need to respond symmetrically to Russia's moves with regard to deployment of INF range missiles. What we need now more than ever is mutual restraint. Um, U.S. deployment and uh, development of INF range uh, missiles will not help the situation, and it's not needed to defend our allies in Europe or Asia. It's not even clear whether our allies would agree to host these missiles. So I certainly hope uh, that we don't uh, um, decide to respond symmetrically. And, you know, you've been following. This story was not out of the blue. It's one of a series of stories about the programs that both the United States and Russia are developing um, and stories about what appears to be an emerging arms race between the two countries. Can you put this in context for us? Sure. Uh, well, the situation is really concerning and it's really dangerous as uh, Secretary Moniz and Senator Nunn recently wrote in a foreign affairs uh, article, uh, we're really entering a period of strategic instability. And so what we need to be doing right now more than anything is talking to one another about strategic stability, about nuclear risk reduction, about how we can preserve and extend New START. And that's really essential. Uh, New START is set to expire in February 2021, and we can uh, take a step, uh, the steps needed to, to extend it to uh, 2026. Uh, with regard to these novel systems that um, that both sides have been talking about deploying but uh, and developing, uh, with regard to the Russian systems, uh, the um, we know that at least two of those systems, the ICBM-based systems, would be covered under New START um, if uh, uh, if New START is extended, of course, in, uh, through 2026 and and before um, New START expires, uh, if those systems come online before before New START expires. Um, the other systems that are being discussed, uh, unlikely that we'll see those systems being uh, deployed before 2026, which is as late as New START could be extended. Uh, but, um, but that's the importance of talking to one another about strategic stability, about arms control, and about how we could ultimately limit the, uh, these systems. Thank you, Leon. Mary, last question. Today is Congress's first day back from the August recess, and it has set an ambitious schedule to get floor votes on a compromise version of the defense spending bill um, before the end of September. Given the ongoing tensions with Iran, what do you think is the likelihood the amendment related to barring an unauthorized war with Iran will actually stay in the final bill? Well, the real question is how hard are Republican leaders, particularly in the Senate, going to fight to strip out this provision? So the Iran Amendment has strong bipartisan support in both chambers of Congress. It's really straightforward and it's really common sense. The amendment bars funding for unauthorized war with Iran without explicit authorization from Congress. And that's why it does have strong support. It passed the House with a bipartisan majority. A similar amendment has support from both Republican and Democratic senators. Uh, the question, though, is Republican leadership, particularly Mitch McConnell, has made it very clear that they oppose this amendment. So this is definitely something to keep an eye on. It could be 
a huge fight in the next couple of weeks in Congress. And with that, we can hear the siren, which tells us we are out of time. Thank you, Leon and Mary, for joining me. Thank you, Michelle. Welcome back to the segment where I get to give Joe a pop quiz. Let's go. Okay. So, from one of our loyal listeners, Gerard, how do you recommend that citizens of countries that are not nuclear weapon states, particularly those that whose governments didn't support the ban treaty, advocate for their country to support a weapons prohibition or something, you know, along the lines of like the NATO countries to, you know, reduce that nuclear yes. risk, get rid of nuclear weapons? Yes. Okay. I, I, I think I can do this. Uh, so most of our listeners are probably in the U.S., so they are in a nuclear weapon state. But let's say you live in Canada. What can you do? Okay, Matt Corder's parents, this is, this is what you can do. You could advocate that your country um, sign the ban treaty. There's nothing against that stopping you. It, there's the, the, the NATO alliance. U.S. has put tremendous pressure on NATO countries not to sign this treaty. But you know what? Um, the current prime minister is Trudeau. It's Trudeau. What's his first name? Justin. Justin. Well, it's his father, Pierre Trudeau, that originally was the first nuclear-armed country to give up nuclear weapons. They, they were a NATO ally. They, they, their weapons were our weapons, so they didn't make them themselves. But they had over 400 nuclear weapons, and Pierre Trudeau gave them up in 1972, in 1970s, and made a bold statement about this. I, I think that was one of the things that helped impact overall the anti-nuclear sentiment in the world. You can do something like that. If Corbyn becomes the next prime minister of England, a nuclear weapon state granted, he's advocated getting rid of the British nuclear deterrent. Scotland has threatened to leave the, 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 the UK, become independent. Guess what? Britain's nuclear sub base is in Scotland. So Scotland would become a non-nuclear weapon state and it could throw out the UK's nuclear subs. So there's all kinds of things you, you can do. I would say one of the, the, the shining example in, the, in recent years of a non-nuclear weapon state doing something profound is the Vatican, a state, a nation. And Pope Francis came out very strongly against nuclear weapons just a few years ago, declaring them immoral, a position the Catholic Church has had for some time, but now he pushed it all the way. He said even nuclear weapons for the sake of deterrence are immoral. There is no justification for having any kinds of nuclear weapons. Those kinds of moral statements can be extremely powerful from any, any country with or even or without nuclear weapons. Thank you, Joe, and thank you, Gerard, for the question. And for the rest of you, please send your questions to press the button at plowshares.org. It's a beautiful day here in Washington, D.C., and I'm here with Hans Christensen. He's the director of the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. He's the co-author with Matt Corder of the Nuclear Notebook that appears regularly in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, but most people just know him as the man. <laughs> Hans is the guy the you man. go to when you want to know, what, what, what are they building? <laughs> what does that thing do? He tracks nuclear weapons all over the world. Full disclosure, Plowshares Fund is a proud supporter of Hans and the project um, at the Federation of American Scientists, and we're delighted. I would say, Hans, uh, your, your information, well, is used around the world, both from the publication of the Bulletin and in the uh, 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 Stockholm, in the CIPRI. Correct, yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you do. What well, do you do every day? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I sit and monitor what nuclear weapon states are doing. There are reports about them, public speeches. Um, I go out using satellite photo to see what how the upgrades are happening at the different facilities. I add it all up and try to make some sense of it. And then once in a while, we write these periodic uh, articles that, like you say, people use all over the world. It's extraordinary. Um, these are publications that have gone out since the 1970s. So there's a long track record. People go back and look mm -hmm. at things. And, 
and compare and see what has happened. The trend, try to understand what is happening with nuclear forces. Because it's not just sort of here and now. There is a lot of momentum. There's a lot of history. Well, this is some of the most useful <clears throat> stuff that you, you do. I mean, it's all useful, but the, the charts over time, in fact, I want you to update them, please. Yes. I noticed there were a couple of years out of date, <laughs> but the global arsenals over time, and mm -hmm. now you've got some great tools. It's dynamic. You can adjust it. You can yep. include just the U.S., just the Soviet slash Russia, but, or, or everybody's. It's, it's, a, it's a great tool. Yeah. I, I've been using them. So, well, before I knew you, I was using your work. Yeah, thank you. Oh, it's exciting. I mean, that's been one of the most rewarding things with this about this work, the extent to which people actually use this Yeah, well, I, I also steal it. We have uh, one of the <laughs> most popular pages on the plowshares.org website, plowshares.org, called the English way, P-L-O-U-G-H, is the Global <clears throat> Stockpile Report, which is all right, your data. Right, right, <laughs> we right. just steal it from you, yeah. <laughs> and we put it up in a simplistic That's form. That's what it's but, for. Yeah. But we link back to your site. That's so what they, it's for. No, thank they, you. They can get the details. <laughs> okay. So we, I want to talk to you today about the state of the nuclear arms race. I've, I've been telling people that we are in a nuclear arms race, but it's not it's not your grandfather's nuclear arms race. Mm -hmm, yeah. it's, it's a little different. Yeah. So why don't you, I want to go through an overview yeah. with, with you yeah. about who's building what. There are nine nuclear armed states sure. in the world. Who's being, w w building what. What are, you, what are you worried about? Mm -hmm. I want to talk to you specifically about China and the Chinese development. Sure. And then uh, near the end of this short interview, we'll talk about um, what we should do about this, mm -hmm. how we should be reacting to mm -hmm. this. Yeah. So please give us your overview. Well, so we are now, uh, you know, a couple of decades, well, three decades after the end of the Cold War, and uh, essentially, and, um, and so what we're, we're seeing now is sort of, if you will, the world powers coming to grip with sort of longer term issues. What should we do with nuclear weapons in the long run? What, what role should they play? Um, the last couple of decades after the end of the Cold War dominated by the drawdown of excess arsenals. Right, since Ronald Reagan. Correct. Down, down, down. Yeah. 70, down, down, down. 70,000 in the mid-80s, as I we got from your We just had too charge, much. And now know. we have about 14,000. Correct. And so we just had too much. And nukes had to go everywhere and et cetera, et cetera. And it was sort of a crazy period during the Cold War. However, they tried to sort of, uh, you know, pace it back and figure out what do we really need for, you know, deterrence for national security. And there's still a debate about that, but we've come in an enormously long way <laughs> uh, from arsenals in the mid-1980s. There were about 70,000 nuclear weapons on the planet and down to around 14,500 today. Um, a huge reduction. And a big chunk of those weapons that are, that are left today are even weapons that have been retired but not yet destroyed. So the number will continue to go down, presumably, the total inventory number will continue to go down mm -hmm. for a number of years until they're done with eating away on those, uh, you know, those uh, retired weapons. Why, why do you say they will continue to come down? The nuclear reduction process has, has stopped. We're not, we're, no, we're not in talks about new nuclear Correct. reductions. There's no talks about yeah. talks. Right. Um, and there's even, I mean, the U.S. wants to get out of, sure. allow, allow the, the, the peaceful death yeah. of the one reduction treaty we have, New START. So right. why so, do you say they'll continue to come down? So when you look at that 14,500 weapons that are in the world today, um, you know, only about four, only about uh, 10,000, nine to 10,000 or so though, are in what you call sort of the military arsenals. Hmm. The rest are sort of leftovers that were retired ah. and they haven't been destroyed yet. Um, and even even today, for example, with the United States uh, stockpile, even though the Trump administration, in its wisdom, has decided no no longer to disclose how many nuclear weapons are in the stockpile, um, during his first years in uh, in power, even though he has strong language, we have to be bigger and better, da, 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 he has continued to reduce the stockpile in accordance to the plan that was in existing during the Obama years. That's interesting, and that is still continuing. It may not continue in the future if he and the Republicans have uh, enough influence on this. Because when we get down further on the line and we're starting to introduce new weapons, for example, the new nuclear sea launch cruise missile they have, uh, they have proposed, 
once that starts to come in, we could see an increase of the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile for the first time since the Cold War. Uh huh. The nuclear, the total stockpile or yes. the operational stockpile? No, the total stockpile. So break it down for me. Let's just start okay. with the U.S. Yes. What do we got and where is it? So the United States and the Soviet Union um, have based their nuclear arsenals on what's called a triad of nuclear forces, land-based, sea-based ballistic missiles, and long-range strategic bombers. In addition to that, they have various levels of non-strategic nuclear weapons, basically on shorter-range systems. Mm -hmm. um, this is the structure we've basically have, have had since the you know, height of the Cold War days. Yeah. And the only thing that has really changed is how many have, do we have, both of numbers total, and how many systems. Mm -hmm. That's been adjusted all along, but this, the core structure is still the same. So in the United States, for example, we have 400 ICBMs in silos out in the Midwest. We have 14 ballistic missile submarines, of which about 10 or so, 9 or 10, are at sea at any given time. Um, and we have right now 60 long-range bombers, B-2s and B-52s, uh, that are capable of delivering nuclear weapons. So that force of 800 launchers is, is what's left in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. arsenal. And for that force, they have about 3,800 nuclear weapons. Um, most of them, ironically, are not even deployed on the launchers. Most of that number of warheads are in storage, but they can be loaded back onto the systems if we need to increase for some so reason that's in the future. The strategic, strategic operational correct. force. That's about the strategic how much? force. Uh, of those, no, about three, of, the, of the total stockpile, about 3,800, uh -huh. about uh, 1,700 or 50 or so weapons are deployed either on missiles, at bomber bases, on fighter squadron bases, uh, 1,750 out of those 3,800. And, and then we have... So most weapons are in storage. Yes, and then we also have weapons that are in then we have dismantlement. About, yeah, we have about 2,000 weapons that are uh, in, in queue, basically, to be taken apart down at the Pantex plant So this is Texas. the part where this, this yeah. is going to continue to happen. Correct. And there are even more, there are even some of the weapons that are currently in the, uh, the stockpile that will go out over the next decade because of modernization programs. This is one of the big strange things about the modernization programs. It doesn't just lead to increases of weapons. It can actually also lead to a, a reduction of numbers. One example, the B-61 bomb is being upgraded. So instead of having four different versions like in the past, they will just have one in the future. This is the airdropped so-called theater. In the Gravity bomb, yeah. That Gravity exists bomb. both as a tactical version and strategic version yes. today. In the future, we'll have one kind. Ah. They'll go both on strategic and on tactical. But that will allow them to reduce the total inventory of tactical or gravity weapons in the stockpile by about half. Right. I remember this is one of the pitches yeah. for when people like me were yes. opposing the B-61, saying it would it, be cheaper to make it out of gold <laughs> than it would be to actually build yeah, it. Yeah, really this expensive is true. This really expensive it, program. They yep. said, no, no, no. Yeah. This is an arms reduction weapon. Yeah. yeah. No, we're going to, in the end, we'll have fewer nuclear that's weapons. That's how they sell it, yeah. Huh. No, that's an important point. by the way. They sold it. We couldn't stop it. Correct, yeah. yeah. So what we're also going to see is on the Navy side, we've just finished an enormous mm. nuclear weapons life extension program of the one of the two warheads that are on the ballistic missile submarines. Um, that involved, uh, by my calculations, about 1,600 nuclear weapons that were refurbished and sent back into the stockpile with some slight improvements, but so that they can live and function in the stockpile for another 20 years, 20, 30 years. Um, once we transition from our current class of nuclear submarines to the new one, the one that's called the Columbia class, mm -hmm. it will only have 16 ballistic missiles instead of 20 that are on the current ones. That means they will need fewer warheads for those submarines when that comes online. So built into that modernization program is also a reduction of warheads. Aha. Uh -huh. So this nuclear arms race has a particular characteristic, unlike yes. in the past, where you were just basically pumping these things out like sausages. Yes. And we were building hundreds a month back in yes. the 50s, 60s, and oh, 70s. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Right? And so this, this, character, this arms race is characterized not by necessarily quantitative Correct. racing, but by types of weapons. Exactly. And you stocked with Yeah, yeah. It is much more about the dynamic that drives ah. the race than it is about uh, sort of reaching for the greatest number, which really characterized the Cold War. 
So di- the dynamic we see at all levels, we see it in the, 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 the needs for the modernization programs, how they've been argued through. It's competitive. It's more than it has been. They're as busy as they've been since the end of the Cold War in the nuclear labs. Uh, it's a very, very hectic period. Um, it's dynamic in the operations, the way we operate before, we're increasing the way we're operating forward, uh, changing the strategies, upgrading. Um, we're also watching a, a change in rhetoric, the way we talk about nuclear weapons. So this dynamic is happen- happening at all levels, and it's more about that technological, doctrinal uh, dynamic, you could say, than, than about sort of numbers, if you will. So l- let me ask about the doctrines or changes that you see in other countries besides the United States. Yes. And let's start not <clears throat> with Russia, um, which gets a l- actually a lot of press, particularly yes. because of the accidents yeah. they've been having with some of these tests, but with China, yeah. which has, is emerging as the threat that is justifying all kinds of weapons across uh, all the services. Where is China right now? Where are they headed? Mm -hmm. What worries you about China? When it comes to nuclear, Mm -hmm. because it's, I think, important to look at the Chinese threat not just as nuclear. Hmm. Um, In fact, I think it's less interesting as a threat in terms of nuclear than it is in conventional. Hmm. And so let's leave aside the conventional for now, but but I think that's just where the big dynamic is. On the nuclear side, China is in the third generation of its nuclear modernization history. You know, early on they came in with, you know, INF range uh, solid or or, or liquid fuel um, uh, missiles. Then they tried to create a ballistic missile submarine. They tried to make their launchers a little more mobile um, and bring in the first sort of solid fuel versions of them. Now we're coming into the third one where we're seeing several types of very improved road mobile uh, ICBM uh, systems, intermediate range systems, and medium range systems that are coming. So they're completely sort of changing their force to a much more survivable, operationally mobile, um, uh, and, and, and responsive force than they have in the past. Um, and on the side of the land-based stuff, they're now uh, you know, they've put out a fleet of about four ballistic missile submarines so far. They're building two more. They're getting ready to do the next generation. And the range of those subs? Can they? Are there is, can well, so th- <laughs> this is their second attempt to do this. And yeah, this so these submarines are very noisy compared to the ones we're operating. In fact, you know, they wouldn't survive long. Uh, because in, we, in would, the we would hear them. We would we know would where they them. are. Oh, absolutely. Um, so they're not survivable, that is. Correct. We so ta- We take them out before they could fire if we wanted correct. to. Correct. And the Chinese also don't operate nuclear forces the way we do, though the Russians do. Um, their force is not on high alert. Um, in fact, the, the, the Chinese leadership is, has always been very reluctant about handing over nuclear control to the military mm-hmm. uh, uh, under normal circumstances. And so their missiles are not loaded with warheads. The submarines are not sailing out with warheads on board. If there was a, the crisis was happening, they would first have to go through the phases of, of sort of uh, putting their forces on, on full alert. Um, so one has to be a little careful about the Chinese. Don't look at the submarine force as something that is out there ready, just like uh-huh. ours yet, and uh, as capable by any means. It is a work in progress, and they're working on it, and they're putting a lot of money behind it. And so more things will happen in the future. The Chinese have a minimum deterrence Correct. policy, yeah. and unlike the United States and Russia, and but more like yeah. the UK and France, yeah. and more like the French, yeah. more like the French. Yep. They say we don't need a, a heck of a lot of nuclear weapons to deter the countries from attacking us. Yeah, I agree with them. <laughs> yeah. Am I missing something? I mean, aren't they right about that? Yeah, they are, and this is one of the big sort of uh, you know, duh in the in in the overall picture of nuclear weapons on this planet. There is no other country on the planet other than the United States and Russia who believe you need to have thousands of nuclear weapons for national security. All other nuclear weapon states have no more than a few hundred. And so, of course, there are people who have been asking, well, can't we also reduce to that? And, of course, some people agree and some people don't agree. But the other nuclear weapon states are not trying to race up and meet the levels of the United States and Russia. 
Recently, we've seen some reports from the U.S. intelligence community, or let me say a portion uh, yes. of the U.S. intelligence community, that claims that China over the next decade is likely to double the size of its nuclear weapons stockpile. And we estimate that China today have just under 300 warheads in their stockpile. So in a decade, maybe 600, according to this theory. Right. This is the Defense Intelligence Agency. Is that, is that the That's one? That's the one. Yeah, they've always been... They've been really good at making estimates, because if you go back and look at them, you'll find that every single one they've made has been exaggerating the, the potential growth yes. of the arsenal. You can see that from the 1980s, it didn't pan out. You can see it from the 19, the early 2000s, it didn't pan out. Now they're saying it again, and very likely it will not pan out. Something else will happen, something less. China is increasing its arsenal. It is increasing its numbers, but it's not a, a, it's not a race for parity with the United States and Russia. Is there any qualitative change in China's forces that worries you? What worries me the most, I would say, is China's sort of apparent entertainment of needing more options. Uh -huh. And we see that in different ways. Of course, they've tried to build um, their land-based missiles with several types, depending on whether the targets or the enemy is far away, that'll be ICBMs, or nearby, like India, that would be intermediate-range ballistic missiles. Um, but, and then, of course, trying to make the submarine force work. Yes. And that force is still not fully up to, to speed, and we'll see what happens over the next couple of decades. Right, so it looks like enhancing deterrence from their point of right. view looks like uh, increased threat from our point of view. They're coming after us in some way. Yes, ways. because that, that's, that tends to be the way we quite often talk about nuclear developments. If a country modernizes, then it is a threat. Or yes. if a country... Certainly, if a country increases, then it is a threat. Well, this gets to the debate that you're hearing in the United States about why we need to develop new, more usable nuclear weapons, specifically low-yield nuclear weapons that we can actually use in a combat situation. Yes. And the doctrine yes. that if we get in a conventional <clears throat> war, we should be willing to strike first. Yeah. We should be willing to risk a nuclear war because using a very small, that is Hiroshima-sized bomb, yeah. Yeah. we might be able to convince the other side to cease hostilities. <laughs> and... Is that, is that justified by some threat that's emerging, or is it just uh, because the other guys are doing it? Yeah, no, 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 I don't think so. And this is the big disagreement in the debate, of course. There are people who argue that it is, and there are others who say um, that it's a fantasy. And I, 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 think, I tend to think that people who cook up these theories and these doctrines are, you know, sort of like a, a, a you know, it's logic. It's in the brain. You sit and do this. Yes. It, it, there's no evidence, for example, that Russia is basing its res nuclear response or nuclear use strategy on whether we have a low-yield nuclear warhead on a Triton submarine. Yet somehow, in the doctrine that the people behind the nuclear post review has, you know, have offered, that is suddenly a theory. Yes. And if you ask them what is the evidence for this, they're like, well, you know, we can't tell you. I mean, the theory <laughs> is that if we take one of our strategic subs yes. and take off the H-bombs, the powerful, yeah. what are they, 435 kilotons? 100 to 450 uh, 400, kilotons. So these are, these are 20 times the size of the Hiroshima-sized yeah. bomb, yeah. 10 to 20 times. We take one of those off yeah. and we put a smaller bomb yeah. on, yeah. that somehow yeah. does what? <laughs> Enhances deterrence, well, I think is the Well, so phrase. the scenario you have to envision is that Russia and the United States are in a war in Europe. Um, it's, it's already gone hot, conventionally. Yes. Um, they're shooting at each other. Uh, the United States and, and, and NATO are pushing back against the Russians. The Russians decide, gee, we can't hold them, and they will push us all the way back. They might even go into Russia. Therefore, we to, need to escalate to nuclear use to, say, to tell them, don't go any further. Right. Okay. So in the Russian, in this scenario, the Russians will look out to the United States and say, huh, oh, oh, yeah, they have really big warheads on their ballistic missiles. So... Go ahead, guys. Let's do this. Escalate. Then an admiral comes running in to the room and says, wait, 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 wait. Um, I've just found out that the Americans now have a low-yield warhead on one of its Trident submarines. Well, okay, then call off the attack. I mean, it's like this kind of scenario where you say there's no, there's no evidence that the Russians would 
pace their response or, or, or level their response based on whether the United States yes. is going to use a low yield or high yield equilibrium. Yes, yes, but the, if you have enough stars on your shoulder or your voice is low enough and you talk <laughs> in slow, powerful oh, yeah, sentences, yeah, yeah, yeah. you might be able to convince politicians to fund this. This is actually one of the issues before the right, Senate right. and the House right now in yes. the Defense Authorization Act. But it's a good example of when you are in a sort of semi-Cold War <clears throat> atmosphere, it's easier to get these things through because yes. you don't really have to prove your point. You just have to say, well, that's the prudent way to do it because if we don't, well, we don't want there to be a gap in Russia's perception yes. of what we can accomplish. Let's say we're successful over the next 18 months of preventing the worst from happening and slowing some of these programs down. And what should, if there's a new administration elected in 2020, do, do you have some top-line recommendations for what the next nuclear posture should be for the United States? Well, I think an important objective has to be that we need to develop a national security strategy where nuclear weapons are not just about deterrence. Hmm. It has to be a grand strategy. Deterrence is one element of grand strategy. If we just have deterrence for deterrence purposes, um, then it's dangerous because it will fuel the cycle. It's not going to make the Russians back down. They're going to do their own uh, you know, uh, version of that. We need to have one that, that put limits and constraints on how we think we can use nuclear weapons and the, the, the role they need to play. That has to be part with um, an aggressive, consistent construction pursuit of arms control agreements that seek to limit and stop this dynamic. Hmm. Unless you have these two things going hand in hand, then it's going to go wrong. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. So I, I would want to see an administration coming in, sort of turning back the clock, to put hmm. it simple. Um, I don't want to just say have an Obama administration policy because that you know, also had its problems, but I want to want to see undoing of this dynamic that get the back Trump on track yeah exactly and it's not that we don't have enough to do <laughs> even without the nuclear modernization programs the new ones that the trump administration has been trying to push forward they have enormous jobs to do just extending the uh, nuclear arsenal uh, of the triad and figuring out how to maintain nuclear production facilities surveillance of nuclear warheads etc cetera, etc cetera. plenty of stuff to do you don't want to jeopardize that core objective by vector, venturing off on these uh, adventures with nuclear supplements, like they call them, and, and overburden the capacity of the whole nuclear complex. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, Hans. Um, where can I write for more information? If people want to delve into your work and, and see this analysis spelled out in greater detail, well, certainly on where our, do they go? Well, certainly on our website, uh, you know, fas.org, um, we have um, all of this material in the Nuclear Information uh, Project. You can go directly, of course, also to the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientist uh, webpage and find the nuclear notebook there that go back to 1987. And you can go on the CIPRI yearbook uh, pages and find their... CIPRI stands for... It's the Swedish International Peace and Research Institute. Uh, it's been putting out these very important books that look at just not nuclear, of course, but also conventional arms control, uh, et cetera, uh, uh, cost of, of armaments, uh, et cetera, et cetera, going way, way back. So really, really important reference material if people want to understand things when we discuss the future of nuclear weapons. And how do we follow you on social media, Twitter? Well, on Twitter, I have uh, my, my little... Twitter uh, account called Nuke Strat, and uh, N U K Nuke N Strat N U K E S T R A T. Thank you. Um, nuclear strategy, um, and FAS of course also has has its web. But I I try to be very busy about um, observations I see out there. Yeah. You know, new developments happening, reports people need to know about, and then of course I like to beat up on Putin and Trump once in a while. So <laughs> that's what we do. Thank you. Well, I follow you, and I hope our listeners will too. Thank you so much for coming in and and uh, educating us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Press the Button. This podcast is produced by Delphine Vigil and Zach Brown. Sound design by Derek Zender. 
Audio engineering by Derek Zender and Will Lowry. Research by Alex Spire. Our theme song is by Lyrics Born and the Poets of Rhythm, sampled with kind permission. Additional music by San Francisco-based bands 17 Evergreen and the Society of Rockets. To continue the dialogue and support our work, visit plowshares.org.